As we gather this night, I invite you to listen to the words of Psalm 51, a Psalm of David. David writes these words, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I have been sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Amen. Friends in Christ, today we enter a holy season of acknowledging our need for repentance and God's mercy. We were created by God to experience joy in communion with him, to love one another and to live in harmony with creation. But our sinful rebellion separates us from God, one another, and all of humanity so that we do not enjoy the life our creator intended. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to a discipline that contends against evil and resists whatever leads us away from the love of God and our neighbor. Because this day is about sin, we confess to both God and to the body of believers our offenses. From ancient days, the season of Lent has been kept as a time of special devotion, self-denial, and humble repentance born of a faithful heart that dwells confidently on God's word and draws from it life and hope. Let us pray, therefore, that our dear Father in heaven, for the sake of his beloved Son and in the power of his Holy Spirit, might richly bless this Lenten tide for us, so that we may come to Easter with glad and joyful hearts. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you this day for facing our sin on the cross for us. Help us during this Lenten season to keep facing your cross as we confess our sins to you. Open our eyes to see both the depth of our disobedience and the generosity of your love and forgiveness. Turn us away from the sin in our lives this sacred season and turn our hearts to you each and every day. In the name of your Son, our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Our first reading this evening comes from the book of the prophet Joel, the second chapter, verses 12 through 17. Joel writes, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings from the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast, let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep before the temple porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. 
Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? And our gospel from the gospel according to St. Mark, the 14th chapter, verses 3 through 9. While he, that is Jesus, was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing for me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth. Wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Here ends our readings. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, in the coming weeks, there will be six separate cases presented that will require you to think critically about and to be impartial to as you are presented evidence by myself, the prosecuting attorney. So I ask you now, will you solemnly pledge to fulfill and uphold all the duties of a juror faithfully and objectively with no reservations? If so, please answer, we will. Now that you have been sworn in, I will show beyond a reasonable doubt that the cases you'll be asked to adjudicate can be seen through no other lens than that of a guilty verdict. And in doing so, I promise to present only the facts of the case at hand. The case before us tonight begs for a verdict of guilty on the count of defamation of character. Defamation of character can be defined as the act of falsely or unjustly publishing or verbalizing a statement that harms the good reputation of another in a malicious or a reckless way. Here's what we know. It was the Wednesday night of Passion Week. Jesus and his disciples have been invited to Bethany, a suburb of Jerusalem, a mere two miles away, for a meal at the home of Simon the leper, a man undoubtedly Jesus had healed or no one in their right mind would have showed up to the party. As it is recorded in other Gospels, it appears that Mary and Martha and Lazarus are in attendance at the supper, a supper that was perhaps given in Jesus' honor since no more than the week prior he had raised Lazarus from the dead. In fact, John will tell us in his Gospel that the unnamed woman in this case was indeed Mary, the sister of Lazarus. The perfume in question has been identified as nard, a precious import from India, perhaps one of the most expensive fragrances of the day, with the street value of that time at $12,000. Those are the unadulterated details, ladies and gentlemen. We have the location, the situation, the present parties, eyewitness accounts, and evidence. But now let me introduce you to the defendants, the disciples of Jesus Christ. Mark recounts for us that as soon as Mary empties this jar of perfume and anoints Jesus Christ, the disciples become indignant towards her. John telling us in his account that Judas was perhaps the most offended, since he was the group's treasurer and wanted his piece of the pie skimmed off the top after that jar of perfume was sold. Supposedly, that money to be given to the poor, but it doesn't matter. They all felt the same. They felt this woman was wasteful and destructive without realizing that Mary knew something about Jesus that they had not yet put together. As the Savior of mankind, his execution was looming. And she knew that once everything played out how the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin wanted, 
his body would be taken off the cross so swiftly that there would not be proper time to anoint him for burial. It would have to be done now. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus would have to act so quickly to avoid working on the Sabbath that they'd have little time for anything other than taking his decomposing body down off of the cross and throwing it in a tomb that didn't even belong to him. Furthermore, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Mary knows something even more important. The disciples will not be around for this. Cowardly, they will abandon their rabbi and friend and go into hiding, lest the same fate await them and a cross for them as well. Mary acted in faith, worshiping her Savior, the one who gave her her brother back to her from the clenches of death, the one who holds the power over illness and Satan, the one who would meet his end on a cruel Roman tool of execution in just two days on the other hand, Christ's closest confidants acted in hypocrisy and in their own self-interest. This is the prosecution's litigation against the disciples of Jesus Christ. They defamed this woman's character and harshly judged her intentions and slandered her just motives. And I might add that this is not the first time this group of men has acted in such a way. Need I remind you that they pulled the same stunt with the small children who wanted to sit on the lap of Jesus only to be turned away. Matthew recounts the same word there that is used by Mark here. The disciples rebuked the little cherubs. The disciples rebuked this woman. Their hearts were hardened. And so are ours. Who of us has not played judge, jury, and executioner over others for their actions while conveniently forgetting to look in the mirror at ourselves? Who of us has not taken to social media or the telephone or put pen to paper in an effort to sharply condemn another? Have we not refused to love our neighbor because they support a political figure we are deeply at odds with? No, indeed. We have gone to great lengths to expose the shortcomings of others while keeping our skeletons locked away in the closet. We have allowed hate and greed and envy and jealousy and pride to dictate our words and actions more times than we can count. Dear friends, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, often writing off the homeless or the poverty-stricken or the least of these writing them off as unclean or unlovable. We have failed to love God above ourselves and even from time to time have abandoned him like his disciples. Like the 12 men on trial today, we have misjudged the intentions of others, quickly labeling them as shameful and slandered anyone who does not live or speak or look like us. We are hypocrites and self-interested. Which is what brings us here tonight on Ash Wednesday. Tonight, on the first evening of Lent, we come face to face with the realization that we are not so different from Judas and Matthew and Peter. We are brothers and sisters to Philip and Thomas and Andrew. The ashes that will be placed on our foreheads in a little while are reminders of this essential truth of the Christian faith. Before God, we are sinners, unjust, unworthy, unfit at our very core. Like our first parents in the garden, we have fallen short of God's glory, wandered from his will and ways, lived a life of rebellion against him, and like God said to Adam in Eden, he says to us, you were taken from the dust of the earth and you will return to the dust of the earth. Sinners have a shelf life. We are mortal. We are imperfect in body and soul. 
And since the most ancient days of the faith, God's people have used ashes as a sign of humble repentance, as with Job, who sat in his own ash heap, and we use them as a visible reminder that life is fleeting. However, and this is a very big however, the ashes we receive on our brow this night are not haphazardly placed in the form of a smudge or a smear. The ashes we receive tonight on our brow are drawn in the shape of a cross as a sign that our mortality is traded for immortality here. Our death is traded for life here. That our grave is not actually a grave at all, but it is a gateway into heaven because Jesus Christ on this cross conquered the tomb. On this wooden tree, God nailed his only begotten son so that you will no longer have to bear the consequence of your sin in eternity. The hypocrite, the judgmental and self-righteous, the indignant and hearted of heart, the rebukers, and yes, even the defamers of character find their rest in the cross and empty tomb of Jesus Christ, find their justification in the cross and empty tomb of Jesus Christ, find their peace in the cross and the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. Because of the cross, Satan is no longer your enemy. Death is swallowed up in victory. Your sin is cast away and remembered no more. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the facts of this case have been carefully laid out and the charges against the defendants identified and substantiated. There can be no other verdict to render than that of guilty. And so it is with us. Open and shut case. We stand before our Almighty God in this Lenten season, guilty as charged. Sinners, trespassers, wrongdoers, and miscreants. But we also stand this Lenten season before Almighty God, redeemed and claimed because of this man Mary worshipped that night in Bethany. Jesus' cross is traced on our brow, not just tonight in ashes, but in baptism with water. A promise that because his love took him to Golgotha, because of that cross and because of the tomb, we will know forgiveness. We will know eternal life. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you are convicted. And you are set free. Amen. You may remain seated as we sing our hymn this evening. We will sing together, Save Your When in Dust to You. I invite you to take your green Lutheran book of worship and turn to hymn number 91.
When the days drew near for him to be taken up, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem and die on a cross for us. So we set our faces to the cross of Christ and face our sin. The Son of God humbles himself so that we receive mercy. Humble me, O Lord, that my life would be pleasing to you. We are justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Mindful of this, we make confession of our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that our very nature is sinful. The root of our sin is pride, and pride has made us love ourselves more than you or others. We have sinned against you by speaking selfish words, thinking selfish thoughts, and taking selfish actions. Hear our prayer and have mercy on us. Since we cannot justify ourselves, our God sent his one and only Son to live a perfect life and die the death we deserve. Because of his generous mercy, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To remind us to face the cross this Lenten season, and to remind us that on the cross, Jesus faced our sin for us, those who wish may come forward to receive a cross of ashes on your forehead or your hand. As with Job, we repent in dust and ashes. For we are dust, and to dust we shall return. But in the cross of Christ we have a future. The ashes on our forehead trace the spot where the water of baptism began our life in Christ. We bear God's name and the cross of Christ on our brow. Would you please rise to receive the blessing and sending? May God the Father, who does not despise the broken in spirit, give to you a new and a clean heart. And may Christ, who bore our sins in his body on the tree, heal you by his wounds. May the Holy Spirit, who leads us in all truth, speak to you words of pardon. Let us go forth into the Lenten season before us in peace. In the name of Christ, amen. We sing our sending hymn, Lord Jesus, Think on Me, number 309 in the Green Hymnal. 